Anna Boutin, thank you so much for joining CNBC today during your Investor Day, the first one in a while. Uh, so very, um, one that was very expected, of course, one with a new CEO on board since uh, January. So you've increased payout to shareholders to 50% from 40% previously, as expected. Um, but one, play, one area where you surprised uh, the market is your ambitious profitability target with a return on tangible equity uh, between 15 and 17%. Um, despite an uncertain macro environment. So tell us how you hope to uh, reach those ambitious targets. Well, it's great to be here. Thank you for, for having me. So first of all, we delivered on all our targets in our 2019 medium term plan. That was in spite of COVID, inflation now, the war. And so this is really important. We have delivered on all those commitments. We set also ambitious targets for 22, which we delivered on. So we had record profitability in 22. What we're seeing for this next phase is we'll continue leveraging and, and really building on the success of our model, which is a customer focus. We'll grow to 200 million customers, net, new custom, net customers, and 125 active customers. And that's at the base of what we are going to be delivering. Um, is this plan that you've presented today going to help you boost your share price? Because Santander is underperforming uh, some of your uh, competitors. So do you think you're going to convince some investors? Well, the, the, key, the key target, it's a new shareholder value creation time for us. We are, for the first time, committing to double-digit TNAF and dividend per share growth. And that is really important, and that should allow us to outperform our peers based on profitability but also growth and in a you know, capital allocation where we are improving for the last eight years consistently. And again, we are committing to uh, doing that again in the next three years. And so again, all this is in a very uncertain macroeconomic uh, uh, environment. And the example is this morning, Spain and those inflation figures and surprise uptick in inflation in your home market. So the, the indication there is a, quite a sticky inflation uh, in Europe in particular that we're probably not seeing the ECB stopping to hike rates. So what's the scenario that you're looking at and how it's going to impact your business? So if you think about what happened over the last eight years, negative interest rates, then COVID, the war, it's actually a very difficult scenario in which we delivered all our targets. So I think what's important going forward is that uh, some slight inflation is actually not such a bad thing for the financial sector, and it's actually much healthier for the economy. We had negative interest rates, savers were not getting remunerated. We have almost zero margin on, on mortgages until a year ago. And so, you know, this is an environment where if you have the model we have with customer focus in market and global scale, super important, and diversification, we should outperform our peers. The double-digit TNAF and dividend per share should outperform our peers over the next few years. If you can just stick to, to your home market, to, to Spain, because there's been this windfall tax that the Spanish uh, government uh, put in place. Of course, this is an election year. So um, you've made the first payment for this windfall tax. Are you going to challenge it? And also, we heard just a couple of days ago, the deputy prime minister talking about the calling for a freeze of payments on mortgages. So a lot of noise on that side. So what is your conversation like with the Spanish government? And are you going to challenge this windfall tax? So uh, our conversation with uh, governments is we are a responsible bank. So last year we made a third of our profits in, the Amer in, in North America, a third in South America, a third in Europe. We paid a third of our profit before uh, tax, in tax, a third. A third went to shareholders and a third went to new lending. So if taxes have to go up, we accept that and we will contribute. We paid more than five billion in taxes last year. But what we say is everybody should contribute in equal ways. That is our thinking and that's what's fair. So are you going to challenge it then? We always have the obligation and responsibility to look at, you know, uh, if, if we have a case, and I believe we have started a process, uh, not just uh, Santander, but the Spanish Banking Association. Okay. If we can look at an other of your markets, of course, the UK, one of your key activities here is mortgages. Uh, we've seen mortgages at two and a half year low here, of course, the cost of living crisis are impacting uh, consumers um, with higher rates. And we also savers asking for higher rates on their savings. So uh, there's a view that maybe the windfall from higher rates for banks here uh, has peaked already. So what's your view on, on particularly on the UK? Well, I somehow don't believe the word windfall is appropriate. When you're talking about margins in Europe, that will be one and a half and two percent margin. That's before cost and before cost of risk. So we're normalizing interest rates. It's not healthy to have interest rates negative because that creates huge misallocation of capital. But by the way, you've been saving all your life. We're not rewarding you for that. 
And it's important to remember that in Europe, with some exceptions like Germany, Switzerland, we did not charge for retail deposits, even though we're being charged by the ECB. And we're giving out mortgages, you know, almost at zero. And so, you know, this is a normalization of interest rates. Because two of the key markets in Europe, uh, Spain and the UK, are two, in a way, the laggards uh, within, uh, in the continent we will see for the next couple of years, um, both still under pre-pandemic levels. So again, how is that impacting your business and how you going, you see the trends? Because again, you have those very ambitious profitability uh, markets despite this environment. So, you know, if you ask me, what is the one thing I'm really happy about and I think we succeeded is in really communicating that the group has value. Uh, and this is really important. So the global businesses, the global Santander network is helping the UK, Spain, the US, Brazil be more profitable and grow mm -hmm in a better way. And this is something we've shown already in some of our businesses, like the corporate bank, like wealth management, like payments. And the big focus is going to be on how do we do this also across our retail commercial footprint. Our almost 160 million, most of those are individual customers. How do we really change the model, leveraging the fact that Santander can build global, more efficient platforms? Yeah, I was going to ask you about that because, of course, you always talk about how this global footprint you have, this diversification is the strength of the group. Um, but there's some analysts that think that it's more of a disparate group rather than diversification. And we've seen other banks actually step away from some of these multiple business cross work and refocus on their home markets. Mm -hmm. um, so why today? And you feel like that was part of your plan this morning, that like you are making the case for that global footprint of Santander. The reason we're making the case today is because we're ready. It's the right time. Because we've done a lot already, but there's a lot more we can do. So we've done it in the corporate bank that grew 33% last year. You know, uh, half of the corporate bank's revenues and, um, sorry, profits actually are derived from the local uh, franchises and the combination with the global uh, platforms. And so what we're saying today is, you know, the next step in this transformation is on the individuals, on retail. We're starting with the US, Mexico, and Spain, but many countries have already done a lot of that work. Mm -hmm. And so you're going to see that in what is going to be an acceleration of growth and shareholder value creation. And again, the double digit, double digit TNAV per share is a number that is very ambitious and that should outperform our peers. Okay, so you're not looking at, at um, selling some of your businesses. We've seen, again, other big banks selling some of their businesses. For example, BNP Paribas lately saying their, their U.S. business. Um, and all of them for a good price. So is that something that you're looking at, uh, potentially? You know, what, what, we, what we look at is at really um, managing our portfolio in the most efficient way. So one of the things we've done is that eight years ago, 40% of our risk-weighted assets were um, actually above the cost of equity. Last year was 80, double, and we're saying 85. So we'll continue to invest 10, 15% across our businesses. But this is an ongoing process, and this is something we'll continue to do. We've divested and sold portfolios for a, about 10 billion the last eight years. So we'll continue to do that, and that's the way we get to the higher profitability. Okay. Um, can I ask you about Brazil, of course, your largest market when it comes to profit. Uh, you made higher provisions in the fourth quarter uh, for the market, and your CFO speaking this morning said that profitability in Brazil uh, will be flat in 25 compared to 22. So give us a little bit the picture on how business is like in that region. So the, the, the two businesses that created more value in euros for our shareholders the last four years were number one, the U.S., number two, Brazil. Mm -hmm. Almost half. Now, going forward, the value creation the next few years is going to be more in Europe because we're coming from negative interest rates and we are a retail commercial bank. So through the cycle, all these countries and businesses are profitable. Again, we look at them constantly and that's what matters. That's the diversification part of our model that we believe is very valuable to our shareholders. And cross-cutting and digitalization is, of course, a big push that you've been, uh, that you've been leading yourself uh, at the bank uh, and very much focusing on in your, in your role. Um, how is that helping you as well, reaching some of those targets that you presented? So the value of the group is evident in two numbers, is that uh, by 2025, 40% of all the group revenues will be driven by global business or platforms, but 50% of the fees. And this is really where you see the value of having the global and the local scale, because that's really important. We have both the in-market and the global scale. That's what really makes us different. That's what's unique about Santander. A very final question because you've been in this business for a long time. Of course, one of the very few women in this level of uh, management is International Women's Day uh, next week. So I wanted to get your view on are things getting any better? 
um, and particularly in, in this industry, but in general, in, in management across, uh, across the industry and in the world, do we see more women coming through? I think they're getting better, but not fast enough. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, we set a goal of having, we, we have 50% of our team, uh, we have 200,000 people across the globe, half a woman. You know, uh, five year, uh, four years ago, only 20% were in uh, leadership roles. We closed 22 with 29%. Our goal was to get to 30 uh, by 2025. That is a 50% increase. And so we're making a huge effort, but we have to do it the right way. Uh, but we also have to accelerate. And so we're putting in place plans to actually make that happen faster. <laughs> So what kind of measures can help to bring in more women? Well, for example, ensuring that we have career plans uh, for women, not just in support functions, but on the business side, making sure we rotate the roles faster, mm -hmm. which tend to be occupied by men. So basically having you know, some kind of a, a rule or an incentive, which at the end has to be incent incentivized so that you move people around faster so that women can have experiences that allow them to get to the top. Being flexible, we've done that for a long time now. <laughs> After COVID, it's like, uh, obviously happening much faster, but I think those kind of issues, you know, and, and to me it's also about personal action. So when you see a manager that needs something, if it's a woman or a man, actually it tends to be a woman, but help them uh, with that personal situation. Yeah. Well, thank you for your thoughts on, on this issue. And Abutin, thanks for speaking to CNBC today. Thank you.